Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Roly Hoy. Glad you made it through Tuesday morning. We've got a very busy day ahead of us. Here are some of the top stories that we are following for you. Florida officials say the recovery in some areas of that state could take years following Hurricane Ian. It will take you to some of those hardest hit areas where homes actually lifted up off their foundations. Plus, a major voting rights case is going before the Supreme Court, how it might impact other states and people of color nationwide. And I'm Roly Hoyts, and I approve this message. Well, maybe not this message, but you hear the phrase all the time in political ads. Why? We're going to verify coming up in just a little bit. But first, let's begin with the horrible news many of us woke up to this morning. At least three people are dead after an apartment fire in North Little Rock. THV 11's Frederick Price live at the complex as more details emerge, and he joins us now. Frederick. Yeah, Roly, good afternoon to you. This fire happened at the Shorter College Gardens apartment shortly before 2.30 this morning. Fire officials have not been able to identify the victims that were involved in this, uh, but they do say uh, that those victims, they're planning on identifying them at some point because this is an ongoing investigation. Just kind of to, to describe the scene to you a little bit, I mean, it has just been a devastating morning for the people. Uh, some of the people that I talk with today say that they heard uh, something that, that was like an explosion, and they looked out of their window, and they saw that a micro wave an air conditioning unit uh, was on the ground. I mean, it was something that they could not believe. Uh, those people, of course, heartbroken and devastated uh, by those three deaths. I can't confirm to you that three people have died, as you mentioned. And uh, let's take a look at the sound that we got from those people that we spoke with. And I look out the window, like I said, it's a burning microwave in the grass. That prompted me to get up and go look out the window. That's when I saw all the smoke, all the fire, the flames, just like I said, it's, it's high at this point is it's not a little bitty fire and a little forest fire this is this is real deal yeah, that really shows how extensive this fire was. When we got on the scene this morning, it was a lot of damage. There were a lot of fire crews here just trying to sift through and investigate to see what has happened. We do know that the American Red Cross is here to assist those families in the North Little Rock School District. Uh, the 7th Street Elementary School is just feet away from here. A lot of students walk to and from this apartment complex to that school district, and they are also assisting families with counseling and anything that they can. That is the latest that we have for now. We're going to continue here to uh, try to understand what's happened and learn more about about the victims and anything else. For now, they were live this afternoon in North Little Rock. Frederick Price, THV 11 News. Thank you for that report, Frederick. Uh, tracking current temperatures right now this afternoon. We're gradually warming up. The pattern has been very rinse and repeat for us for quite some time. This is what we're seeing right now as of this afternoon. 76 here in the metro, 75 in Conroe. So generally around the mid, slowly entering the upper 70s this afternoon, nearing 80 degrees already in Camden, but still stuck in the low 70s to our north. So tracking those temperatures later this afternoon, low to mid 80s. So it's going to be very rinse and repeat. Like like we've been dealing with the last few days, clear skies on top of that as well. So we'll expect more mild days ahead. The fire danger remains high, but we do have a cold front later this week that could usher in some changes. More on that coming up. Corrales, thank you. Well, nearly a week after Hurricane Ian and CBS News has now confirmed that more than 100 people died during or after that storm. More than 400,000 people in Florida are still without power. Manuel Bajorquez is in Fort Myers Beach. You can see they're having to use barges to bring in heavy equipment and trucks. That's because the causeway here, where well, there are entire chunks of it that are missing, disconnecting this island from the mainland. In the aftermath of Hurricane Ian, Sanibel Island hasn't just been damaged, it's been left isolated too. From above, the extent of the destruction is staggering. Trees flattened, homes shredded, roads ripped apart by sand and mud. But from the ground, a clearer picture emerges of just how life-changing Ian has been and will be. The scenes here on Sanibel Island are almost apocalyptic. You don't see a soul in the streets. There's not barely a sound here except for a few birds and some of the helicopters uh, that are still doing rescues and bringing supplies in and out. More than 2,000 residents have been rescued and evacuated in Florida since Ian made landfall, including Lacey McClary, a local artist who was airlifted to safety from Sanibel Island. Yeah, I can't believe it. That's, believe that's still here. We traveled with her across the bay over the weekend at what used to be her studio on San Carlos Island. 
McClary recorded the storm as it tore through her friend's house where they rode it out. When we were on Sanibel Island, she asked us to check on her house. So unless things have moved around, I think this is her house based on all the paintings. Uh, it definitely looks like it's destroyed. As local officials sweep Sanibel Island to find survivors, some evacuees are returning to see the damage firsthand, like the Jankowskis brothers who took a boat here. Devastation is unreal. You know, it's just, it's kind of sad to see. It's horrible. I mean, you walk down these streets, you can't even recognize what streets they are. It's a tragedy, and that's all you can pretty, pretty much say. Florida officials have defended the timing of evacuation orders here in Lee County, which came less than 24 hours before the hurricane came ashore. They said those orders went into effect as soon as the storm's track put the county in the bullseye. President Biden is set to visit the area tomorrow. Manuel Bajorquez, CBS News, Fort Myers Beach, Florida. After months of supposed planning, a celebratory Little Rock Music Festival may not happen at all. This comes as the city attorney has canceled the contract with the Lit Fest promoter. This latest setback comes amid questions of how Mayor Frank Scott Jr. selected Think Rubix to organize the planned weekend of concerts and seminars. Vice Mayor Lance Hines told THV 11 that the festival should be investigated by either the Pulaski County Prosecutor or Arkansas State Police. We've reached out to the promoter and to the mayor for comment but have yet to receive any response. The mayor appeared briefly at Philander Smith College this morning at a public safety forum where he shared details of his crime reduction plan. This all comes as the city prepares for celebrating National Night Out. The event gave different city officials a chance to explain their responsibilities for carrying out the mayor's plan. The mayor left before taking questions, but our Jalissa Garza heard what he and others had to say and will bring us a full report tonight at 5 and 6. One of the founding voices of country music has died, family announcing that Loretta Lynn left us at the age of 90. The singer, songwriter, and country music hall of famer became synonymous with defiance and toughness as a woman of Appalachia. Her biggest hits came in the 60s and 70s, led by Coal Miner's Daughter and You Ain't Woman Enough. Later autobiographies and movies about her life made her a global star beyond her music. No cause of death was announced, and again, she was 90 years old. The conservative majority Supreme Court heard arguments this morning on a contentious case involving voting rights in Alabama. At issue is a Republican-drawn congressional map which consolidates the majority of black voters into one district. As Natalie Brand reports, it's also the first time in history two black Supreme Court justices are on the bench for a case involving race issues. Case 21-1086, Merrill v. Milligan. In the first big case before the Supreme Court's newest justice, Katanji Brown Jackson, the high court heard arguments on a key voting rights case out of Alabama. At issue, whether Alabama's redistricting plan for its seven U.S. House seats violated part of the Voting Rights Act. Alabama's map cracks that community and allows white black voting to deny black voters the opportunity to elect representation responsive to their needs. A group of voters in the Alabama NAACP filed a lawsuit against the Alabama Secretary of State seeking to create a second black majority congressional district. Alabama is 27 percent black, but only one of its congressional districts is majority black. If I know that I, I, I'm voting in a district where no matter how many times I come to vote for certain seats, my vote doesn't matter because of how the district has been drawn then there's little incentive for me to, to participate. In January, a lower court ruling found the new map likely violated the Voting Rights Act, but the state argues adding a second district would force it to sort voters by race rather than by a, quote, race-neutral approach. The only way to add a second majority minority district to Alabama's plan is to make race the non-negotiable criterion. Alabama is allowed to proceed with its new map for next month's elections, but the high court's ruling in this case could affect future elections not only in Alabama, but in states across the country. Justice Jackson also pointed out Alabama's fraught history. We're talking about a situation in which race has already infused the voting system. This is also the first case involving race issues to come before the high court now with two black justices seated. Natalie Brand, CBS News, the Supreme Court. 
THV 11 is your election central, and there's just a week now to make sure you're registered to vote in the November midterms. All eyes are on the Arkansas gubernatorial race, but voters will also face four important ballot questions, including legalizing marijuana. On Monday, Pulaski County election officials hosted a voting machine demonstration, trying to show how easy it is to make your vote count. On election day, um, you will have a paper ballot to vote on, and you, of course, you will put your paper ballot into the ballot scanner. Um, there will be one touchscreen machine at each location for voters with disabilities to use. If you want to take a look at all the important deadlines that are coming up and learn how to cast your ballot on November 8th, just text the word VOTE to 501-376-1111. So once you're registered, then comes early voting and, of course, Election Day on the 8th. That means weeks of a lot of campaign ads. And with many ads, you'll always hear the words, I approve this message. But where does that come from? And do politicians always have to say it in their ads? Megan Bragg has your Verify Fact Check. I'm Ted Budd and I approve this message. A line you will hear more and more with the November election right around the corner. A viewer asked, where does that come from and do politicians always have to say it? For answers, we went to Catawba College political professor Michael Bitzer, the stand by your ad provision of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act and the Federal Election Commission, also known as the FEC. In 2002, the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act was passed. In it, a provision that requires candidates running for federal office to claim their ads. It is federal law that all candidates have to acknowledge that if they are paying for this particular ad, they have to claim credit and responsibility for it. The FEC is very specific about how the message should appear. The written statement must come at the end of the ad, appear for at least four seconds, and must be clearly readable. So why is this provision in place? And the belief was that perhaps if candidates have to take ownership of the ad's message, that perhaps it might tone down the kind of negativism that we have seen in attack ads. Unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. Though negative ads are still abundant on TV and social media, candidates have to take ownership if they're the ones paying for it. With your Verify Fact Check, I'm Megan Bragg. From zero waste to zero emissions. After the break, we'll show you the speedy solution some say there could be to the climate crisis. Plus, Corrales. We need rain, but when are we going to see it? I'll let you know what the models are saying in your forecast just ahead. <laughs> 